Hello and welcome to the Sandeep Roy show on Express Audio. The Sandeep Roy show. Time magazine's lists always make news, but its recent list of the 100 most influential people in AI really got social media buzzing. Not just for who was on the list, but for who made the cover. OpenAI's Sam Altman was on the list under the leaders section, but missed a cover spot. But India's Anil Kapoor was on the cover. That left many scratching their heads. Well, Anil Kapoor was on that list because of a case he filed seeking protection of his own name, image, likeness, even his chakas catchphrase against misuse on the internet. But he's not the only one worried about living in a world of AI run amok. Already we are torn about ChatGPT. Many find it an indispensable tool for being more efficient at work. It quickly creates a reasonably good email or presentation or summary and saves hours of work. On the other hand, professors worry that their students are turning in ChatGPT essays. But there's way more to AI than ChatGPT. A new book code dependent living in the shadow of AI by Madhumita Murgia looks at how AI can affect our security, our health, our privacy from that ad we see on Instagram to a bank officer deciding whether we can get that loan or a government trying to figure out who might become a dissident. Madhumita Murgia joins us from England. Madhumita Murgia, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I guess ChatGPT has made AI sort of the buzzword but ai has been around and part of our lives long before that could you give us some examples of what we are doing in daily life that's already used or using ai that maybe we are not really aware of so i think that to many people you know as you say the chatbot interface is the first time they felt they were interacting with ai systems but it's actually decades old the technology but for us in terms of our modern usage and ai is infused into all of the apps and the devices that we use every day the recommendation systems of our social media apps so we understand that ads are targeted to us or posts on instagram or the entire feed of tiktok for example and all of the targeting and the recommendation systems are powered by artificial intelligence when we have the gig apps that we use to order for deliveries whether it's food deliveries with swiggy and uber eats and so on or even getting a ride all of the back end of those systems are powered through ai and it's not just you know figuring out the quickest way to get you your food but even things like the delivery workers wages who should get a particular job how should the task be priced on any given day all of that is dynamically done through ai systems and increasingly you know on our phone things like your photos app if you've got android or iphone smartphones you can now search you can say find me a photo when i was on a beach or find me a picture of my daughter and it now knows from your pictures it's learned who the different people are what the backdrops are and it can actually just find you what you're asking for just through regular sort of natural language it's now part of the financial services system banks use ai to decide whether to give you a loan or a mortgage governments are using it now to figure out how to allocate resources so it's just sort of deeply embedded not just in our consumer life but but in our sort of wider public life as well all of which you sort of go to the pros and cons because many of us look at it and think oh it's actually really cool if instagram is suggesting ads that really appeal to me but with chat gpt so what was it about chat gpt that was so different from the other examples of ai that you just talked about that really took people by surprise i mean in your book you write even its own chief technology officer wasn't prepared for how chat gpt exploded why did it feel so groundbreaking yeah it was a surprise to everyone and maybe add another point about actually why the targeting and recommendation systems aren't as benign as we think you know it puts us in a bubble because it's all we see and we don't know why things are being targeted at us But ChatGPT was a shift because it moved AI from being sort of embedded in the background of the systems that we used. 
for most of us using gig apps or, you know, ordering things or trying to apply for a loan, you don't think that there's a statistical system in the background that's deciding whether you should get it or what you should be shown. Whereas with ChatGPT, it came to the fore, right? It became very visible because you know that you're talking to a chatbot. It's not pretending to be a human. It's not a customer service representative. But here you know that these are automated generations of text you type description for an image and you get an image out the other end. So it's a very direct interaction for the first time. And it is, as a technology, much better than much of the AI systems, particularly when it comes to generating text, language, than we've seen in the last five years. The difference between chat GPT and the system that was powering it even a year before is that easy consumer interface. You know, that's, I think, what captured people's imaginations because it meant that they could really push at this themselves. You can kind of play around with it. So it's that magic of being able to do it yourself without, you know, an app in the way. But I think there's also something a little more. And one of the problems with ChatGPT was that it also fabricated facts, that it made up, uh, you know, conferences that didn't happen and footnotes and people commented on that. But weirdly, I feel that also made it feel a little more sentient to the user. Like, look, it can make up shit just like any human being, unlike the computers of science fiction that we were used to that could never lie. Yes, I think this is not just chat GPT. This is inherent to all modern generative AI systems, right? That the way they work is they predict. So they're predicting what's the most likely next word or the most likely arrangement of pixels in an image or audio bytes in an audio. And so ultimately, it's just predicting what it thinks is the most likely next step in a pattern. And it's programmed to give you an answer. It's not programmed to say it doesn't know. And so when you have AI in decision-making systems, like does this person have breast cancer or should this person be given a loan or should this person be given bail or not or denied bail? The way that it gives its answers is a probability, right? It will say I'm se- it's 70% likely that this person will reoffend or that this person has this disease, etc. But when it comes to generating words, the probability isn't clear. It's not saying I'm 70% sure that this is the answer. It's just giving you words to look at. And so I think that is what we call hallucination. It's telling you some things with so much kind of confidence, yet it's completely made up and it has no basis in reality. But I think that's a kind of misleading term because as you say, hallucinations kind of implies that it has some kind of human ability and it's, you know, making things up and it can't stop itself. But really, these are just fabrications that are coming out of a software system. As somebody who's written about this technology for over 10 years and spent, you know, three years on this book, it's I think a really slippery slope to start comparing it to humans in the sense that, you know, trying to find aspects of human nature in it, like sentience or consciousness or even understanding to begin with. There is none, right? It is ultimately statistics. When it tells you a joke, it's not doing it to make you laugh or because it knows what the joke means. It's just finding you a likely combination of words that it knows is from previous jokes. I mean, what I found really amazing and alarming and fascinating was you talked to someone in the book who said they used it as a therapist and that actually it was better than most of the human therapists she had been to because, you know, it knew sort of exactly what she wanted to hear. Yes, this is kind of the interesting trend that's coming out of it. If if you have a technology that speaks to you in the language you're used to, your own language, which is spoken or the written word, you start to sort of anthropomorphize it. You start to kind of imagine that it there's a human behind it or even treat it in a human-like way because that's how we communicate with each other, right? Using words. And there are many, many people around the world who've started using chat GPT as a therapist, as a mentor, as an advisor. I know investors who say they use it as an investment advisor, you know, are these good decisions that I've made from my investments. So it's just people are talking to it and how the way that it works well is it reflects you back to yourself. So it's like sort of having a mirror there where you tell it things and it sort of turns it around and, you know, throws it back at you, which makes you question and which can be really helpful. 
I thought it was really interesting that this woman who she actually tweeted about this said that it was better than all the human therapists that she had tried. And it kind of makes you wonder what ultimately people are getting from this. Because of course, it tells you what you want to hear. But I don't know, isn't the point of trying to, you know, heal or, or speak to a therapist that they tell you things you don't want to hear? But when you see that, that, for example, when the chat GPT is telling you a joke, it's not doing it to make me laugh, but it's doing it knowing that this is the pattern of words that could elicit what I'm looking for, which is to laugh, you know, because I've told it, tell me a joke, tell me something that is funny. What's the difference between that? Um, I don't think saying tell me a joke means it knows you want to laugh. That's the difference. It doesn't know that a joke is something that's going to make you laugh. Or what laughter is. Exactly. Or even why you would want to be told a joke. If you're a human, then you understand instantly that you want to be entertained, right? You can make those connections because we have a semantic understanding of being human and what that means. But what how large language models work, which is the technology that underlies these systems is it's just looked at a huge amount of data on the internet, say billions, trillions of words, and it's found the connections between different words. So it knows where joke sits in the universe of words, where it has something to do with a question and answer, and it will pull together a combination of sort of previous jokes that it's been trained on. And Often these jokes are not funny, but, you know, it's still kind of interesting. And it's much more that it understands the relationship between words in like a word space rather than the meaning of anything or the purpose or any motivation. In fact, you talked to the writer Ted Chiang, who wrote this really interesting piece for The New Yorker about it, where the way he described it was really, really astute, where he said, it's basically a blurry JPEG of all the text that's out there on the web. Can you just elaborate on what he was getting at there? He calls it lossy compression, right? Which is when you sort of compress an image, you're losing a lot of the like finer detail and the nuance, but you're still preserving the sort of essence of that image so that when you pass it on, you can sort of recreate it. And that's the parallel that he's making with language models where they are shown, you know, just huge volumes of text, writing, comments, blogs, books, you know, things that you and I may have written or spoken about. And it's finding relationships between all of those words and in a way creating a compression of that. And then it's able to get like a blurry understanding of how those words relate to each other. And it can recreate it in a very sophisticated way, almost at a level that's indistinguishable from human these days when it comes to being able to summarize or generate text, right? But it's still like, I guess his broader point is in that compression and blurriness, it's lost the nuances and the detail, which when it comes to humans, it's kind of the why, you know, why have we written something or the purpose behind those words? That's what it doesn't have, but it can give the impression very well of having understood text and therefore can be really useful in specific scenarios. So as a, I mean, given that as a writer, selfishly, this is my fear. I mean, the writer, Wahini Vara, whom we've had actually on this podcast, she wrote that the most read and most admired thing I've ever written is an essay I co-wrote with AI. It was with ChatGPT's predecessor, GPT-3. It was an essay called Ghosts About the Death of Her Sister, and it went absolutely viral. Yeah, and you talk about that. And she said, not just that, I believe the AI wrote the essay's best lines. So my fear is, when you talk about how sophisticated it is it's getting, could one day Chad GPT look at everything you've written or everything I've written and produce an original essay that sounds and feels like you or I have written? Is that where we are headed? So it can certainly produce something that sounds like something we've written, right? Because that's what it's best at doing. It's a statistical system that learns from data that can reflect from what it's learned and essentially recreate that. Right. So it's very good at sort of recombining and recycling through what it's learned and sort of creating a version of that. But I guess the question, you know, you said, can it make something original? And that's definitely, you know, the jury's out on that. And I think with Vohini's essay, what I think is interesting is it was her idea. Her idea was to write about, as you say, the death of 
her sister, something she hadn't been able to write, you know, because it's such a difficult topic by herself. But that was the motivation for it. That was the idea and the originality. And then yes, and then she co-writes where she sort of gives these prompts or these lines, which are her lines, which it then sort of auto, not so much auto completes, but takes on, but on from her and writes, and then it goes back and forth. So I mean, for me, the most moving part of the essay was the fact that the topic, the theme of the essay and the fact that she couldn't write it on her own. So she used this tool to work through it. It was those things. And I think if we just had a chatbot or an AI system write something from scratch, to me, and I think Ted Chang, you know, similarly reflected this, it wouldn't have the same impact. Chat GPT has no understanding of what death is or how it can impact a person. And those are the things that make good writing or good film or good art work for people, right? It's, you can sort of see into the creative person's soul in a way or into their mind. And also find a reflection of yourself in Mm. there. So that's, I guess, for me, the big difference is when you have a software writing this, it can be impressive. You can think like, oh, that's well written. But I don't think that it has the originality that comes with experience. So obviously, people I know who use it have said it's been an immense productivity boost. We all know it can write that letter to a funder or that project report, sort of dead work that you have to do that just takes up time. But from people you talk to or from your own experience, what are the most exciting possibilities they see coming from something like ChatGPT? It's a really good question because we have been just taking this for granted. And people have been sort of very charmed by how good it is at generating text. You just think, wow, this is amazing. But I think we're now at a point where lots of people have used it and got a sense of how it works. But I think there's still a big question about how is it actually going to change how we work or how we do things, right? And from what I've seen, you know, as you say, and as Ted Chang describes it, I think he refers to it as bullshit jobs, or he was quoting somebody else. It's it's a sort of filler text. For some people that might be drafting or company emails that they spend hours over, but they can just now write it as bullet points and it generates an email or the sorts of texts that require time, but don't require sort of brain power. But also I've talked to people who are working on writing projects who use it to sort of test out their ideas. So they might say, I'm thinking this is an argument that I want to put forward in my book or in my essay. Can you think of conflicting arguments or can you push back against that? So, you know, finding holes in your argument or in your hypothesis that ChatGPT can sort of bring you contrasting examples to push against that. Or you might say, you know, here are the four themes I was thinking of focusing on in this wider area. Has anyone else written about this and what have been their big themes and takeaways? Can it get someone through writer's block? Well, yeah, maybe, you know, because I don't know how you work with this. But for me, it's often actually not spending time thinking about it, right? It's actually doing something totally different, like going on a walk or reading something else or or even changing where you sit, which helps to open up your mind. And yeah, possibly having a conversation. Often we don't have people in our lives who want to have in-depth and long conversations about little writing issues or creative blocks, right? But it's something that's tireless, that will listen to you forever and non-judgmental and not going to get bored. And so, yeah, so it can be a useful sounding board, I guess. And it's more than just a sounding board, right? Because it's able to maybe respond, even if it's not, you know, at the level of an editor or a peer, you know, it's good enough to sort of throw stuff against. So I can see that it's a good way to brainstorm. What I don't see it doing is creating a piece of work, a piece of art of a quality that people who are amazing at those jobs would be proud of. I think it can be a great assist, though. Though I guess people also worry in some sense that while it might take care of some of the bullshit jobs, and this is where so many artists have been worried about, like now AI can be used to do my artistic work. It can mimic my voice. It's using the content I've created to create maybe not original art in that sense, but a version of it that's original enough. And then what am I left with? The bullshit jobs. Yeah. So I have this recurring line about being good enough in the chapter right at the end where I speak about generative AI. And that's what it is. It's good enough. There is this fear of when you, with companies that are trying to, you know, save money, you can see why it would be much easier to replace an illustrator or a graphic designer who takes time, effort, money to create something beautiful and original, whether it's for a video game or an ad campaign. 
you can get something that's pretty good rough draft of it. And then you can hire somebody for half the time just to do the final mile, right? The last mile and pay them an absolute fraction of what you would otherwise. So that is happening already. You know, I talk about this in my book, even in the context of facial recognition, healthcare, totally different contexts, but where we have this innate human trust of AI systems, as you said, where we sort of assume they are calculators in a way or sort of deterministic outputs with the correct answer. And so we tend to value these answers higher in many ways than we do like human output. And so the fear is that we lose sight of actually that actually, you know, human creatives or human work is better quality because of the convenience and the ease and cost effectiveness of using an AI system. And and I think that, you know, the outcomes will not be good of that, because as I say, this is good enough, but we're going to lose the quality and the people who come to these jobs who can no longer be sustainable, right? It's not sustainable to be paid a tenth of what you do if you're a creative person. And I want to get to the predictive part and the dangers of that. But speaking of good enough, sometimes it can be almost too good. People are already worried about deep fakes and that is part of the conversation. And you have these horrific stories about this woman who suddenly realizes one day that she has been deep faked into these horrible porn videos that are out there or deep fakes that can incite a riot. Where are we headed with deep fakes? Because it seems like the law is not anywhere near catching up with the technology there. So you're right. I think that, you know, I, as I said, there's a sophistication of the technology that means it can be very realistic. So the context matters. So it might not work at the length of writing a whole book or like creating a work of art. But it can definitely be indistinguishable from humans if it comes to audio clips or short videos or even, you know, writing posts on social media. And that's what we describe as deepfakes. And I have a whole chapter in my book that focuses on two women. One is an Indian immigrant in Australia, a young college student. And another is a poet, quite a famous published poet in the UK who's with a young child who, and neither of whom knew who had deepfaked them or how they had become victims, but just discovered these horrific videos and images of themselves online that were manipulated using AI. We are in a world, it's not moving towards. That's the whole point of my book is this is our present, not our future. You can literally text... You you know, apps, a picture, and you can be sent back a picture that's basically a nude of that person. It's literally as easy as texting a friend. And it's cheap too. So this brings down the barrier and it means there's just going to be huge numbers of, and this is largely men and the victims uh, from the data is 98% women. And I think in terms of regulation, there are countries are waking up to this now. And I think they aren't as far behind as they have been when it came to social media over the last 10 years, for example. So, you know, India has started thinking about how to regulate deep fakes already and has said that, you know, responsibility of the tech companies that generate them to help to identify. Similarly, the UK has now got a law that says it's illegal to distribute deep fake pornography, for instance. And there are, you know, scattered states in the US that are doing this, South Korea and so on, are also starting to but, integrate. But have any of those laws worked, Motivata? They are just coming into play. And I think the hard part is, of course, if somebody does this in the privacy of their home, it's really difficult to identify the source. Like if there's a person sitting in their parents' garage doing this and sort of posting it to a hundred sites, it might be difficult to find them. But you can hold the sites accountable. So the pornography sites shouldn't be hosting these deep fakes. So if you have a law, then they they become part of the accountability cycle. Similarly, if you're saying to tech companies, if your technology can produce these types of images, then your responsibility is to be able to identify it. So you now have people like Google and OpenAI creating these sort of watermark and meta as well, saying made with AI, right? So at least we can differentiate between what's real and what isn't. So a big, big part of the sort of social effect is that we just don't know, you know, it's chaos that's sown through not understanding what's real and that like poisons the public conversation right so I think a really important step is to even just be able to identify this is real or this isn't so that we can at least track that back and to hold other players in the ecosystem not just the perpetrator accountable. Now one of the things that you go into at length in the book is uh, you know, not just like that ad on Instagram or the next word or sentence predicting that, but AI being used to figure out 
how people will turn out to be, what they're going to become is, will this kid grow up to be a juvenile delinquent? Will a young girl become a teen mother? How prevalent are these programs? So this is really important because people are now starting to think about AI as just something that is a chatbot or creates a picture or whatever. But as I said, actually, it's very much embedded in other parts of our lives, much more consequential parts, you know, that where it helps to make very important decisions. And some of them are still aren't sophisticated artificial intelligence. They're more just kind of statistical algorithms. Many governments around the world are using this to help them, for example, figure out is anybody doing welfare fraud? If somebody's applying for benefits, you know, is it real or is it fake? So they're using AI to find that out. So I focus on healthcare in India as an example in my chapter about this doctor, Ashita Singh. And, you know, India's a great example of how AI is being used to sort of bridge the accessibility gap in healthcare and using it to figure out if people have tuberculosis or other illnesses. This, again, is not just in India. It's happening in here in the UK, in South America. So the criminal justice system example that you gave in Amsterdam, there are police forces in the UK, in the US and elsewhere who have trialed AI systems to predict if people will go on to commit crimes or to figure out if a person will commit reoffend if they are let out of jail on bail. These decisions are life changing for people, whether you get bail, whether you get government support, whether you're diagnosed with an illness. This is truly life and death much, I think, more consequential than some of the generative AI applications that we're speaking about. And this whole area is completely unregulated. So when you have answers or probabilities being predicted by these systems, we haven't thought about who do we hold accountable if that's incorrect. Over the next few years, we're going to see more of that because it's a way to, you know, just as we talked about with generative AI, it's a way to cut costs. It's a way to increase efficiency and in some ways can do so, right? It does make right. sense in some cases. Yeah, and in some cases, that they're in theory, they can sound like programs with good intentions, like let's invest more social resources on these kids who our AI is saying might end up becoming a juvenile delinquent or this girl in this neighborhood this, who might have a higher risk of teen pregnancies. But I guess the question becomes, A, has that actually worked as a deterrent or preventing the pregnancy? Is there any data on that? And uh, in the end, do the ends justify the means where, you know, some kid who is, might be nine or 10 years old at that time, is basically an algorithm unknown to him has branded him as likely to become a juvenile delinquent. That's exactly it. These are exactly the ethical issues that I grapple with with my stories of real families. And often what I found through my reporting of this book is we go in with pre-decided that this is a more efficient and a superior way of doing things compared to the status quo. And without thinking through actually testing the outcomes, is this correct? Is this working? Is this even useful? In the case of the teenage pregnancy predictor in Argentina, and I went and visited uh, Salta, which is the small town in northern Argentina, where they did this system, you know, it predicted that one in three girls in the families living in an area were of high risk of teenage pregnancy. So at that level, where it's one in three families, you know, do you really need an algorithmic system to point this out to you? So I think in many cases, it's misguided techno-optimism, where you sort of just expect that it's going to do the right thing. And in most cases, there are errors and people don't find that. And no, there isn't data uh, really about how much of a deterrent this is. In Amsterdam, they continue to have a system. You know, this was a family I spoke to, a mother whose sons turned up on a list which said they would go on to become criminals. They still use this system, but they said that they no longer use AI as part of it to predict. Instead, they use existing data about children's behaviors, maybe, you know, uh, truancy from school and things like that to put them on these lists rather than sort of predicting the children who aren't in any trouble, who are simply maybe living in vulnerable areas. But the data that I've seen, it's not quite clear, but in some cases, fewer crimes committed, but then a proportion of the boys go on to commit even worse crimes. And it's not clear whether what it would be without the intervention. Were these boys pushed into that because of their increasing interaction with police? Because as soon as they're on these lists, it feels punitive. They immediately become targets 
of police. And so it many cases pushes them into a world that they might otherwise have stayed out of. So I think with human behavior, using statistical systems, I think I find tends to have very unintended and unexpected consequences, because there are so many factors that play into how we behave as individuals or families that isn't necessarily predictive, particularly around the world, right? Different cultures have different ways of behaving. So imagine building a system in Silicon Valley and expecting Indian families to behave exactly the same as a Catholic family in Argentina, right? There are so many other factors that you can't code into it. The phrase you used, techno-optimism, really struck me because I think there is this belief that, well, AI will be, because it's an algorithm, it'll be color and race agnostic. So it will be more objective than the creators that it shouldn't, in theory, have the bias that some corrupt bureaucrat might have the one who is, you know, who might be funneling funds to their favored people or redlining you or not giving you the loan. AI will remove that bias. But in fact, what you're saying is the bias can get baked into the system. Absolutely. And there is widespread evidence of that. So I think to play devil's advocate there for just a second, the goal is to remove these variables to be more objective. And I think that if you do carefully design and you're actually constantly testing the outcomes of the systems, you can adjust for it. And maybe this can be a great tool to include as part of a decision making system. But in practice... It's reflecting the biases of the data. And in many cases, even if it's good intentions, there's unintended bias that not only gets baked in, but gets sort of propagated and exacerbated because we use AI systems at scale, right? So two quick examples in the case of the Amsterdam children's list where it was predicting criminals. The vast majority of the children on this list were boys so male, and were black or brown. So they were from the sort of uh, immigrant communities from Morocco and Suriname who had moved into the sort of outer fringes of the city of Amsterdam, even though the system was supposed to be and was race blind and gender blind. It still ended up targeting very specific subset. And these were particularly, you know, socioeconomically disadvantaged immigrant, a single mother families, right? So you can see clearly there's a bias there and but we don't know how it's been baked in because technically these weren't variables that the algorithm was supposed to consider. Another example in healthcare is I talked to Ziad Obermeyer, who's both a doctor and an AI researcher in Berkeley, California. And he looked at a system by a big health insurer in the US that was used to decide which chronically ill patients should get extra care, right? And so this algorithm would sort of triage people and say these people would benefit from early care in advance of of them getting worse. He analyzed this algorithm and found that it was systematically biased against African American. And the reason for that was they were using healthcare cost as a proxy for healthcare need. So they said, we look at how much these people cost the healthcare system, and that will give us an idea of how much they're using it, which seems like a sensible proxy, right? But in practice, there were some communities, in this case, African-Americans, who were costing the system less because they were not having as much access to it. So either they couldn't afford it, they were blocked from access, you know, all sorts of other cultural and socioeconomic reasons why they weren't making use of the system. But that didn't mean that they didn't need it. So the result was that for uh, African-Americans with the same level of illness or disease burden as their white counterparts, they were not being given access to this extra care at sort of 30% of people who should have were not getting it. And once they discovered that gap, they were able to change the design of the system to rectify that. This was a system that touched 78 million Americans. And similar systems are being used in the EU and elsewhere that, you know, touch up to 200 million people. So you can just see how quickly these sorts of unconscious or unintended biases get multiplied, right? And And yeah, I mean, I can imagine if something like that was used here, exactly the same thing would happen. The people who need healthcare most are the ones who probably access it as a last resort. There are cultural reasons for that too, right? We have uh, indigenous Ayurvedic medicine. The reason people don't go to doctors isn't always the same in every place. So this is the thing. It's about which variables are used to design it and how it reflects different cultural contexts. And I guess shows the importance of checking the outcomes. No, the ones we talked about right now, okay, are things with good intentions that you're trying to 
prevent juvenile delinquency, teen pregnancy, whatever. But that same predictive models with the different sets of variables can also be used to figure out who might become a dissident, a troublemaker, sort of a civil rights activist type. In China, that's happening today. Right. I spend uh, one of my final chapters focused on an activist, Maya Wang. She was the human rights activist who actually revealed the big data infrastructure that's being used in Xinjiang in China as a dragnet to target the Uyghur Muslim population there, right? And they do this through a bunch of different variables, through tracking, you know, who's using voice over IP services like Skype or Viber, who's calling abroad, but even broader than that, you know, who's got a beard, what sort of books do they read, who's turning their phones off too much, you know, it's just basically any way to track people and sort of drag them into this net of surveillance. But there, there's a wider, more national data program. That's exactly this. It's trying to focus on predicting who might become a dissident, who might cause uh, trouble. You have this uh, particular group of people in China who travel from sort of small towns to protest small bureaucratic issues to the central government. They are allowed to come and complain about issues in their local context. And these people are being tracked now because the feeling is that if they start with complaining about little tiny bureaucratic things, they might end up becoming more active and exercising their voice more. And there's an example of an old man who sort of turns his phone off, takes seven different modes of transport, essentially just to evade this digital net so that he can go to Beijing and put forward his complaint. And next time, as soon as he even turns his phone off, he has, you know, a huge group of police turning up at his house saying, why is your phone off? Even here in India, when the CAA protests were happening, we heard about drones and cameras scanning crowds, you know, looking for troublemakers or habitual offenders and things like that. And we all know that our faces are being captured without our knowledge by these CCTVs and ubiquitous lenses. And we've sort of come to accept that. But what you're writing in terms of AI, it's not just capturing the images. That this is then training these machines to become super recognizers. What's a super recognizer? Yeah, I think there's a shift, right? Because on one hand, there's cameras watching you, but you know that there's footage being recorded. And yes, maybe somebody's looking through it, whether that's police or whatever, looking for someone specific. But then the shift is that now the cameras themselves can recognize, right? The software within the cameras can find anybody and they can do so instantly. And that changes, you know, your identity in a public space because you can no longer be uh, outside displaying your identity, whatever your identity is, whether it's you wearing a bindi or whatever, you know, a sari or a scarf or a beard, you're automatically being identified, recognized and, and known in a public space. I talk a little bit about uh, an activist in Hyderabad who fights back against in a court case with the Telangana government, for example, saying, why are you identifying, you know, poorer people and not like rich people in their fancy cars in upscale neighborhoods? And so, you know, there are differences in who gets surveilled as well and who is recognized and who gets to stay outside of the dragnet. And I think these inequalities get exacerbated because of these surveillance systems. Here in the UK at public festivals, you now have police driving around with facial recognition vans in certain areas looking for people. So I think it's really without any regulation here, it's changing how people will behave in public and what they feel they can reveal about themselves. And the police will say that we are using this as a way to keep people safe, that we are, our facial recognition will recognize that criminal, that wanted person who's out there and we're keeping the rest of the people safe. And as in, and in your book, you go through cases where sometimes they've misidentified somebody. The cameras are not foolproof, but now there's the problem, like when the algorithm says you're a bad person, then it's very difficult to get out of the grip of the algorithm. But is that the main issue, that the cameras might sometimes be wrong, or is there a deeper problem here? There are multiple issues. So I think one is that the as we've been discussing in our conversation so far, these are statistical systems, they can never be 100% correct. So inherently, there are going to be errors. 
And in the case of facial recognition, there are known biases. And actually, scientists haven't quite figured out why. So they're not as good at identifying female faces, not as good at identifying darker skinned individuals compared to Caucasians and men. So this is an issue because if you're going to have higher rates of misidentification of darker people, and particularly in countries where there are racial differences and divisiveness, then that creates huge social problem, right? You're misidentifying black men at a higher rate than white in the US and that causes uh, unrest. And so we need to fix that before we start to use this as a fail safe thing, you know, that police rely on. I can see why this would be a good filter, right? Because even if it's not always correct, it could be useful to say, I'm looking for this specific criminal or person or child who's been kidnapped and sort of cycle it through a series of photographs or footage and it spots the people that you with your human eye can't. But at least it gives you, you know, 10 options that you can then start to investigate. But when you're rolling this out live, onto a community, a population at large, where majority of the people in that group aren't criminals, aren't uh, kidnapped children or kidnappers or so on. What you're really doing is making it, you know, everybody's expectation is that their data is being captured, stored, for the future. So the deeper question is, we call this privacy. And it is, it's about privacy. But for me, it's also just about how it damages trust in a community where we all believe that anybody could be a criminal at any time, and we have to be watched. And also what happens with that data, right, when it's captured and stored forever, you know, today, we might trust a government or a police force, but tomorrow, there might be somebody else in power, there might be hackers or criminals who can get at that database, then it's no database is 100% safe, right? And I was at an event recently, and there was an amazing academic at Oxford called Carissa Velas, who gave the example of Nazi Germany, right? And she was talking about, I think it was in Austria, maybe where data had been collected on citizens at large about sort of religion and, you know, who they were and all of these details and had been collected and filed away. And when the Nazis, you know, rose to power and were able to access that information, it meant they were able to target the community Mm. they wanted to and essentially, you know, imprison and kill and hurt those people. And without that sort of seemingly kind of innocuous database about people, they would have never been able to do that. So it's kind of a lesson from history about why do we want to categorize and catalog every single person when we don't need to, when we can find other ways of doing targeted sort of crime prevention. The problem, as I see it here, Madhumita, is that while many people, even say an Elon Musk, might talk about the power and danger of untrammeled AI, the people who might rein it in, like governments, have lower incentive to do so because from what I can see is that all governments, whether they're democratic or autocratic, would love the power to know who's plotting against it to nip it in the bud. All over the world, you have governments using these technologies, you know, whether it's in the US, which we've seen with Snowden, for the work that they want to do, which is kind of find people who are going to create trouble or identify terror plots and things that they feel are important for, you know, and we agree, right, that are important for national security. But I think part of government's responsibility is also people feeling that they're having a fair experience, right? And if you have uh, financial services unfairly denying loans or mortgages, people are, you know, finding that their benefits are frozen, which has happened in the Netherlands, happened in the UK for no reason. Um, I talk quite in detail about Uber Eats drivers who there's so much opacity that they have no idea why they are being paid something, why they are being denied jobs, where you feel just, you know, so curtailed as a human, there's just no point participating, you know, you're going to have unrest and unhappiness there too. And and so I think governments will recognize that you can't have a society where there are deep fakes running wild, and where you have people being given wrong diagnoses, or there are unfair decisions being made in the workplace or in government services or in criminal justice, because that's going to lead to lawlessness to dissidents, probably, and certainly sort of, you know, unhappiness amongst citizens. So I think there will be an incentive, you know, to say that these systems, if you are going to have them in all these education, healthcare, courts, then they have to be fair, and they have to be regulated. But I'm sure there will be exceptions carved out when it comes to sort of a surveillance and national security. And that's true whether you're in India or the EU or in the US, you know, or democratic or otherwise. And when you speak of healthcare in India and you have a whole section on that, 
Is that the sort of most promising use of AI that you found in India? Definitely for me, that's one of the areas that I think will have the biggest, AI will have the biggest, you know, really life-saving impact. Part of it is, as I said, in India, it's plugging the gaps, you know, reaching people. And in particular, I was focused on um, the Bhil Adivasi tribe in Chinchpara area, which is on the border between Maharashtra and Gujarat. But there are, you know, places all through the interiors of India where people are, as you said earlier, you know, lacking access for various reasons. And, and you can use these kind of AI systems to at least filter and triage people to into the government system of final diagnosis, treatment. So you aren't having people dying of treatable diseases like tuberculosis, which we have today. And I think in India, but also elsewhere, there are a huge shortage of trained doctors, of radiologists, and a huge rise in certain illnesses in the Western world too, like cancers and Alzheimer's and so on. And so I think this can go beyond just plugging gaps and helping with accessibility to actually helping to advance human knowledge and the current status quo of what we know. So you're saying it can actually add to existing knowledge. Exactly. It's able to diagnose certain cancers even before doctors can see it or it's able to differentiate what's going to go on to be a more aggressive form of it. And these are much more tested and tried applications of AI, right? There's a specific data set where you can show it scans and then it's able to see which scans actually go on to become aggressive and which ones don't. So there are peer-reviewed studies published about this. So I think that genuinely augment uh, human knowledge and human ability in the healthcare and broader science space to inventing new drugs, for example, or new types of materials that are more suited to climate change and things like that. I think that we can use as part of our innovation and research pipeline rather than integrating it into our sort of social and behavioral pipeline, which I think is far more risky. But all of this, all of what we are talking about, obviously is underpinned on the fact that it requires enormous amounts of data to be collected. And uh, in India, for example, you write about the fact that Google teamed up with the Aravind Eye Hospital to test this AI software that could diagnose diabetic retinopathy. And uh, the ASHA healthcare workers are also becoming data collectors now in addition because they're trusted in the community. And so it sounds like a win-win, but you're writing that, that there might be a problem here as well. Well, so I think that the broader story here is that there are very few companies that are building the most sophisticated AI systems. The power here is hugely concentrated, mostly amongst a few companies in Silicon Valley in California, because particularly the newer AI systems, as you said, require huge amounts of data, but also huge investment capital. You know, the cost is high and you need an infrastructure, which is, you know, chips and cloud computing infrastructure, which again is the domain of maybe three, four companies today. These big tech companies that have all the ingredients that allow them to sort of develop the most sophisticated. AI systems, but they need data from everywhere. For me, it was about pointing out how you have these big tech companies going to, you know, many parts of the developing world, the majority world to get the data, to be trained on it. Yes, in some cases, building systems that will help locally as well, but always using that to inform development of their technology that they then go on and sell elsewhere and make billions from, right? So I think governments, particularly in the majority world, in the global South, need to be particularly aware of is being too dependent on these companies and not seeing enough of the upside, right? Because they do need data. And particularly when it comes to sort of healthcare, this is very, very sensitive data that it's not easy to access and how are Indians benefiting from this? How are we increasing the wealth economy? How is it benefiting from these AI systems? And the individuals themselves, the ASHA workers who are collecting data, the people who are giving up their data, you know, are they seeing the upside of this or is this all going into sort of enriching a few small corporations? And it's not just they are very deeply integrated into government services and infrastructure in India, in Mexico, you know, across Latin America, across Africa now. And this is true, not just of the US, you know, China, for example, is looking at how it can export its technology into Africa as a sort of soft power move too. It's not so much a danger as showing the reality of how the corporate power is concentrating more and more and that governments of India and others developing countries need to be able to own the technology and bring it to the people who need it the most, not just the people who can pay. 
So basically, we could otherwise we could end up with an AI version of the East India Company. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that ultimately, if you have just a few companies producing these systems, many of these are public companies, right? And ultimately, they are answerable to shareholders, and they have to turn a profit. And so their incentives are not exactly aligned with governments or citizens, right, or patients. They might have some overlapping incentives, but of course, ultimately, they have a different purpose. And the danger is that you cut everyone else out of the conversation. And then you have a version of an East India company which kind of wields all the power and decides who has access to this and who doesn't. Or creating a two-class system, maybe where the AI system is for people who, you know, can't afford care and the human augmented system is for those who can. You actually, as part of the research for the book, went to places in Africa where there are people sitting in these buildings doing, they are the back end of AI. We are seeing this shiny AI world where of driverless cars and things where humans are not required anymore. But you've seen what the humans are doing, the ones who are moderating that content on Facebook and deciding, is this beheading video too much? Should this be taken off? What was that like? You know, what was it like there? Can you describe it? Yeah, so I spent time in Nairobi and also in Sofia in Bulgaria with two different companies that employ vulnerable people mostly. So in Nairobi, it's mostly young people from Kibera, which is the largest slum in Africa. And these are, they're paying a living wage, adds up to about three to four hundred dollars a month. They are getting certain benefits holiday pay and so on. And I visited also the homes of the workers. And I think in many cases, this has made a huge change in their lives, right? Going from manual labor or domestic work, jobs like that, informal jobs into this kind of job really changes the trajectory of a person or a family. But the other side is they're not treated as somebody who have voices or agency over the work they are doing. They're sort of either doing their data labeling tasks and not interfacing with their clients, which in many cases are people like Meta or Tesla or Walmart and other. Um, or in the case of content moderation, you know, are having to see this really, really deeply disturbing content, everything from violence to abuse to terrorism, awful type of violent content that has to be filtered off of social media. But they're made to do this for hours at a time with very short breaks, not able to speak to anybody about the content they're looking at. So a huge mental toll for these people. In the case of Bulgaria, they were employing people fleeing from war. Many were refugees. So it's a great way to integrate them into the community, to give them digital jobs. But they're doing nowhere near enough in terms of the rights of these people, but also so that more people can see the upside of AI. We're talking about, oh, it's these productivity gains and these the huge change it's going to have on our economy. The first sign of it is these jobs, great, but how are they going to go beyond earning their $4 an hour? They're still so precarious, you know, they're a step away from losing a home. It's very much not enough to support a family. And the companies doing this work, there's a company called Scale AI, you know, it's just raised a round of over a billion dollars and is valued at sort of many billions of dollars as a company. So how is this wealth being distributed to the actual workers who are doing the jobs? Currently, they're just fully invisible. Do you feel as a tech reporter, Mudamita, that you perhaps started out on this project with more optimism than you ended it with? Um, you know, for me, I went in pretty agnostic, I would say, because I knew that there would be harms. But I went in thinking, you know, this is a gray area, there'll be both benefits, and there'll be harms. And I can kind of give a realistic picture on the ground. And I think by the end of it, I myself was quite surprised that there were many different reasons for it, but how often it failed in practice when you integrated AI and how the harms were very focused and unidirectional, particularly, you know, against those who are vulnerable. So you were seeing a split, the benefits being experienced by uh, small groups, but actually the same harms, whether it's like lack of labor protection or racism or gender-based violence, like with deep fakes, same old problems being amplified and showing up again and again when it came to AI too. And I guess that for me was disappointing. But also, you know, I came out actually in some ways feeling more important Empowered and hoping to empower the reader to say, here's what I can see is happening on the ground. But now that we know we can do something about it, right, rather than sleepwalking into a place where we just rely on these systems blindly to do always do the right thing. 
if we can accept that they are flawed, even if they might be useful, that will change how we choose to implement them, whether we, you know, choose to bring them into our children's schools or whether we choose to use them in hospitals and we can have a voice. Just knowing more is always more empowering, right? You know, because I thought the fear through popular culture and science fiction, especially, it was always about AI running rogue, the Frankenstein's monster, or even HAL in 2001 Space Odyssey. But reading your book, I felt like the real danger, and I don't know if you'll agree with it, is that we think AI will be more fair, more objective, and so we outsource that final decision to them. But that human sort of intervention to spot the exception, the aberration is not there anymore. And it's true a human being can show bias. Maybe an algorithm properly tweaked will not. But a human being can also show empathy and AI cannot. And compassion too, right? And so I guess that's the difference is we have to figure out as a society and that's uh, true in different cultures and countries whether we want to preserve that human dignity and that respect that we have for one another. And that will be reflected in how we implement AI and which spaces we allow it into, or whether we truly believe that technological solutions are superior to us. But for me, it's in the middle, right? It's always maintaining that human dignity and respect and compassion for one another, but using this as a tool to help us make decisions, but never putting it first being able to recognize when something doesn't fit the mold or doesn't conform to the system and trying to ask why. Whereas the more we start to automate uh, these parts of our lives, whether it's creativity or decision making, it's very easy to just say the computer says no or yes and move on from that. But then we're losing our voice and our agency, both as the people who are implementing it and as the people who it's being implemented upon. Not just voice and agency. I mean, I could see that we actually could become duller as people, whereas AI was supposed to take away all those dull tasks and leave us to be smarter and brighter and do the smart things. But instead, we've just become duller because we don't think anymore. We just trust the machine. That's exactly a fear. And I think when we particularly talk about it a lot as a positive application for education, one of the key issues is if we're training kids alongside AI systems to say, it will tell you the answer, it will write essays for you, then how are we developing how our kids think critically, challenge, debate? And I think that's going to be really key for the next generation to figure out what does education look like? And I think that will be key because this is the new, the future. It's much more what we as humans can do, not how can we make the technology do it for us. So I think it's our work remains to be done. Well, thank you for talking about this brave new world with us, Madhumita Murugia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Madhumita Murgia covers data and emerging technologies for the Financial Times and was appointed its first AI editor in 2023. She's the author of the new book, Code Dependent, Living in the Shadow of AI. Code Dependent was shortlisted for the 2024 Women's Prize for Nonfiction. Find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at Express Podcasts. This show was produced not by AI, but by Shashank Bhargav and edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. Thanks for listening. This is Sandeep Roy on Express Audio. 